people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, we do have some um, apologies and members on leave of absence. Uh, Councillor Dan Loden and Councillor Jimmy Murphy are on approved leaves, leave of absences and Councillor Alex Castle is a, an apology for this evening. Councillor Harley will be here but is just um, running a little late. So we will start the meeting by opening public question time. So what Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, I've received two declarations of interest. The first is from Councillor Toppelberg, a disclosure of interest affecting uh, financial and proximity. Uh, the item is 5.2, change of use 342 William Street. Councillor Toppelberg discloses uh, that he has an association with the applicant, the association being that his family owns a property at 346 William Street, Perth. Uh, as a consequence, there may be a perception that his interest on the matter may be affected. Uh, he declares um, that he will consider the matter. Uh, he will leave the room for uh, the discussion. The second uh, disclosure is from yourself, Mayor Cole, uh, in, related, in relation to item number 6.1, minor parking restriction improvements and amendments. Uh, Mayor Cole discloses that she lives on the adjacent street However, the outcome would have no impact on Mayor Cole or her family as they do not park on Britannia Road. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Mayor Cole's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Uh, Mayor Cole declares that she will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um, what we often do is we go to the items that were raised by members of the public gallery so that if you're waiting to hear questions and answer from council members to administration, you're not sitting through numerous other items. So just in terms of the items that were raised, I see that the first item on my list of with people that are still waiting in the public gallery is um, item uh, 6.1. So we'll go to that item first, councillors which um, is minor parking restriction improvements and amendments. So if um, council members wish to ask questions in relation to this item. Yes, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, just the question was asked in relation to um, Waver Tree Place uh, about Saturday mornings. Uh, can we just get some information as to whether that was uh, looked at and whether the whether we do whether we've got any data to support uh, the request. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, the parking uh, surveys were undertaken um, on a Saturday um, at the same times, uh, 8 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. Um, so the, the occupancy um, does vary. Um, certainly did peak at 67% um, on 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. on some Saturdays, so it is still reflective and consistent with some of the days during the week. Councillor Gondoszewski, did you have a question? No, it was the same um, as the Saturday parking. Okay. It would be um, probably prudent to prepare an amendment. Yes, um, look, there's two things. There is some additional data that I was provided with because I did go to meet with some of the residents um, to talk to them about what was being proposed by administration and um, perhaps we could have included in the briefing notes, Director, the information that I was provided that actually showed the occupancy um, and by day and by um, hour, the times recorded, because I did note that there was on Saturdays 100% um, peak um, for 8am and 2pm on Waver Tree, and 57 and 67%, I think, um, total when you take, is that right, when you take both streets into consideration. I um, also just wanted to flag that I'd like to request an amendment for Saturdays. I just wanted to ask the question about, in terms of what we'd normally do for Saturday mornings, what are the hours of restriction, what are our standard hours of restriction, noting that these are 3P restrictions. So, for example, if it was 9 to 12, it wouldn't be very effective. Um, through you, Matt Cole. 
I think there's a, there's a variety of Saturday restrictions. I think the standard is 8 till 12.30 uh, or 8 till 1, but we can check that and put some information in the briefing notes if you're happy with that. Thank you. So just noting that I'm flagging the amendment to put that forward and I'll get that information from you during the week. Thank you. Councillor Fatakis. Um, through you, Mayor Cor, I just also wanted to um, ask whether there have been consideration given to um, the restrictions beyond 6pm um, as well during the week. Um, through you, Mayor Cor, uh, no, there, there's been no uh, consideration of restrictions beyond 6pm. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, are there other areas um, within the City of Vincent and even nearby where we do have those restrictions, um, considering that there have been um, issues in those streets with night time parking uh, from staff as well? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I need to take that question on notice. Um, any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. Thank you for attending Britannia Road residents. Um, you're welcome to stay, you don't have to leave, but we just sort of get that over and done with for you. Um, so and just in terms of the other items that were raised from the public gallery this evening, um, I believe the next item with people still remaining in the gallery was item 5.3, which is number 47, Eugen Street, Mount Hawthorne, section 31 reconsideration, five um, group dwellings. Questions in relation to this item? Councillor Fatakis. Um, through you, Mayor, to the Director of Development Services. Um, just uh, with regards to um, I suppose the query um, that we've had before about impact on um, local parking, and I just, um, it's just more for improving my understanding. Um, the units um, two, three and four do actually have quite a sizable area in the upstairs um, that could actually lend itself in the future to becoming um, a bedroom area. Um, is there any sort of consideration that council or um, what impact on parking requirements would there be if those units were to actually present as a full bedroom or in fact um, sometime in the future change that area to uh, reverse those from a three bedroom to a four bedroom residence? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the R codes do set out parameters that uh, stipulate the parking requirements based on uh, number of bedrooms in a dwelling, but it also sets out parameters based on the location of the dwelling, whether it's location A or B, which is just effectively a reference to the available public transport options. Uh, in this case specifically, uh, there would be no impact for this site. Um, so whilst there are rooms that are available that could be used potentially as bedrooms, uh, it has no implication on the parking provision. Councillors, any further questions on item 5.3? Okay, um, the next item that was raised from the public gallery with a, a member who asked the question still present, or sorry, did a presentation, is item um, 5.8, amendment number three to local planning scheme number two, number 51, Marion Street, Leaderville. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, through you to the Acting Director of Development Services. Um, first question, so the uh, local development plan that is alluded to, uh, is that at the discretion of the applicant or how is that prepared? And the reason I ask is, uh, whilst the, it's, the intent would be for the lots to be amalgamated, would there be opportunity for the Council to insist upon specific design guidelines for uh, in, particularly in relation to height and setback uh, over the portion of the property that currently is zoned uh, R30? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, the intention of the LDP would be to stipulate provisions relating to height, setbacks, separation, uh, built form quality, etc. Uh, in terms of how that is required, that is effectively at the discretion of the Department of Planning or the West Australian Planning Commission. So you'll see in the recommendation uh, number five, it's that council requests the commission to require a local development plan. So that decision to require a local development plan 
sits with the Planning Commission. So two more questions. So within that context, if it was required, it could, for example, say, so given the lot width is, say, 12 metres, it could say uh, that the allowable height within X number of metres of the, uh, of, of the eastern boundary is two storeys, three storeys, 27 storeys, whatever it may be. But the LDP, whilst the lot may be amalgamated, it can be uh, as specific as that to, to determine that's, that, that's the initial question. Is, is that possible to re request that or require that? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that is possible. Okay. Secondly, given that it is up to the WAPC once we decide, if we decide to proceed with the uh, scheme amendment, my understanding is it's entirely at Council's discretion whether to decide to, decide to proceed with it. Uh, if Council is of a mind not to proceed with it, what avenues would then be open to the landowner? Uh, because my understanding is they can't appeal the decision through SAT. It's something that would need to go through the courts. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, are you referring to the amendment process or the LDP process? The amendment process. If Council was not to initiate the scheme amendment, which is at Council's discretion, what avenues would be open to the applicant if they still wish to pursue rezoning of that land? Through you, Mayor Cole, if Council resolved not to initiate the amendment, uh, the matter finishes there. There are no appeal rights to the, the tribunal. It would be open to the applicant to advocate to the minister to direct the city to amend the scheme, uh, but I'd suggest, given the minor nature of the amendment, that would not be likely. Councillors, questions? Um, I do have some questions on this item. I'm just wondering if in the briefing notes we could have a bit more of an explanation around what is the community benefit of the rezoning proposal. Um, what is the officer's assessment of the impact of introducing mixed use um, into the residential built form area? Um, would, if the rezoning went ahead, would the next adjoining R30 lot um, be treated as a side boundary or rear boundary calculation from whatever development um, occurs on the site. Um, is it possible to require an LDP prior to a rezoning um, request? And just some questions around how does this meet um, the local planning to strategy of high density living on corridors? and maintaining lower density residential areas. Um, a question as to whether it would be possible to have the mixed use um, fronting Oxford Street in terms of um, the uh, shop fronts, etc., or the mixed use downstairs, whether that would be fronting uh, Marion Street as well as Oxford Street under a potential development application. Um, and also um, in terms of LPS2's position on transitional sites, what is the administration's understanding of that position in our local planning scheme two? Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, I also had a follow-up to my question. Given that uh, it's at the absolute discretion of council to either pursue the scheme amendment or not, uh, is it possible to make this uh, to make that conditional upon the uh, LDP being prepared? Are we able to only in initiate the amendment on condition that the WAPC does require it? I understand it, it's still their requirement, but can our support be conditional, or is it just to initiate the amendment or not? Is that the only option available to us? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the latter. Um, it would be inappropriate to effectively condition a, the, inst the initiation of amendment. So I know that Mayor Cole's questions were perhaps asked on notice, but can you answer the one about whether the LDP can be required prior to initial? Well, I guess given it's our discretion, we can ask whatever we want, can't we? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the Council could refuse to initiate an amendment until it was satisfied uh, with the proposal it has in front of them, um, and that may well entail the preparation of a concept plan or a local development plan. As I said before, the, requ the requirement for a local development plan rests with the Planning Commission only, uh, so the Council cannot require a local development plan, but 
irrespective of the amendment process, Council could still request that the Commission require a local development plan for either the three sites uh, that are already zoned um, mixed use or the four sites in question. Councillors? Oh, sorry, I also had a question. Um, I'd like to know whether the um, applicant has spoken to the immediate adjoining neighbour as well as Aaron Moore Senior College and other residents in the neighbourhood. Any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. The next item that was raised in, by a member of the public gallery who is still here this evening was item... Uh, hang on, just sorry, let me just double check. Five point two. Yes, five point two. Number three hundred and forty two William Street, Perth, proposed change of use from shop to restaurant cafe. Any questions on this item? Thank you, Mayor. Um, to the director. My questions uh, relate to the cash in lieu, pardon me, um, that would be paid by this uh, by this business. Have any of the businesses that have been on the site paid the City of Vincent cash and loo prior to now for other uses? So perhaps if you could answer that and, or take it on notice. Just wondering how much money we've gotten out of the businesses in, in the time that we've had a cash and loo policy. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the City has not received a cash and loo payment for that site previously. Thank you. So my question relates to if a cash in lieu amount is paid, let's assume for the sake of the argument the full amount, what capacity does the city have to use that cash in lieu amount to increase parking in the area, to amend any of their parking spaces, to um, adaptively, you know, kind of change line markings, etc. So in other words, will the cash in lieu amount actually be used to increase parking or to um, contribute to you know, uh, public transport costs, blue cat costs, or anything else. I just want to know what it's going to be used for. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the collection of cash in lieu is intended to broadly fund initiatives that will likely fall out of the integrated transport plan, uh, which is in the process of being prepared. So whilst we don't have any capital projects uh, in the pipeline at the moment, the intention is that the money will be used on an array of transport initiatives not exclusively the provision of car parking, but other initiatives as well. Um, and are any of those initiatives in and around the William Street area? So will there be any direct um, positive impact on that area? I'm not, I'm not saying they shouldn't pay it. I just, I just want to understand, because I think we're, we're reaching peak point in some areas at which this will be challenged, I suspect, at some point more vigorously. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. The We've only recently appointed the consultant to uh, prepare the integrated transport plan. So once that has been done, and that will be based largely, or at least in part, on detailed traffic surveys, uh, once that data is acquired and the plan is prepared, uh, a series of initiatives will be recommended and it's envisaged that the cash in lieu that we've collected and continue to collect will be used on implementing those initiatives. Sorry, if I'd, I'll answer the question. Um, but there's no guarantee at this stage they will be spent specifically on this uh, this area. Thank you for answering those. I guess I'll foreshadow a you know a discussion at a later time about the ongoing collection of cash and loo in areas which we've peaked out um, um, in parking. Councillor Gontoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to the Acting Director of Development Services. Just a question in relation to the provision of um, motorcycle or scooter parking bays in the area. Are you aware if there is any and or, um, I guess, any any other sort of parking that could accommodate um, the uh, demands of the uh, takeaway side of the business? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, staff have done an assessment of the car parking and the bicycle parking, but we have not done that assessment, but we will do that during the week and report back next Tuesday. And I suspect I know the answer to this, but um, given that I have seen it in occasion in places, um, in relation to um, uh, scooter parking on um, public verges, that's... Um, and... Uh, or 
um, is I think I'm probably you know harking back to Europe, but where it seems to be tolerated quite well. Um, but in terms of the delivery drivers, there's no provision for people parking um, bikes or motorised um, scooters or motorcycles um, within the um, public verge, is there? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, under our local law, you can only park on a verge with approval of the adjacent landowner. So unless that approval is granted, um, we can enforce that local law. Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, to... Um I think this is a question for the um, Director of Development Services. Um, just when we were looking at um, calculating that um, that shortfall of car base um, and taking into account um, uh, the credit of 8.2 base, I'm just trying to get my head around um, um, that versus um, a business with that acknowledging that they only have two staff required for. 56 dining customers. Um, one was really looking at whether a business of that size would only ever have the requirement of, of two staff for a staff and obviously the impact that that puts on a parking assessment. The other, and it got raised from the, um, from the gallery, um, and I also looked at whether there was consideration for um, the impact on temporary parking for delivery services such as Uber and Deliveroo, and we've seen um, the impact of those services on um, town centres, specifically Leaderville, and the need to actually make sure that we've got um, the you know the shorter parking. And I suppose for me, when I was looking at um, taking cash in lieu, um, taking into account uh, the reduction of paid parking down to you know short stop parking, and the impact that that would have um, revenue-wise on the on the city. So it was just really the, um, the amount of staffing level um, and taking into account the consideration for temporary parking. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in terms of the staffing level, uh, administration did um, raise that, uh, particularly with the applicant. Uh, the applicant was quite clear that they run it or intended to run it as a husband and wife operation and that they would only have two staff. Uh, in terms of the impact that has on the calculation, it's relatively limited because uh, if you see on page 22 of the agenda, it is uh, equates to 0.15 bays per person. So even if they added, say, another two staff, you would only add another 0.3 of a bay. So the actual impact is quite, quite limited. Uh, in terms of the second question about uh, deliveroos and those sorts of uh, providers and whether parking is provided for them, uh, the way the current parking policy is structured, it does not provide uh, any additional requirements uh, on for a shop or a restaurant or a cafe land use that might attract those uses. It simply uh, refers back to the number of people that are going to be attending the site irrespective of how long they're going to be attending it for. Yeah, yep. go ahead. I'm um, to the director. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at this online, and my um, magnification glasses, only 1.5 magnification so far. Um, I can't see any end trip facilities. Are there any included on here? Assuming the husband and wife might want to cycle to work or customers, etc. <coughs> Through you, Mayor Cole, no, they haven't provided those facilities and don't intend to provide those facilities. Through you, Mayor, to the Director, why are they not being required to provide end trip facilities given it's a, a change of use and it's a requirement that we've put on many, many other businesses of, of a similar um, ilk, cafes, restaurants, small bars, etc.? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the policy only requires one short term bay. Um, and end of trip facilities are generally aligned with uh, longer term bicycle parking bays. Sorry, that said, it would be open to council if it was of the mind to impose that as a condition. Yep, so just to clarify, just for the public record, because they're not providing any car parking bays, they don't have to provide end of trip facilities 
essentially. Uh, it, it summarised, yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor Colts, because they're not intending to provide long-term bicycle parking bays. And why aren't they providing long-term bicycle bays? Director, are you just having thinking time? Okay. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the applicant is required to provide long-term bays. That's uh, obviously an error in the report, uh, and that will be updated during the week. Sorry, just to clarify, that it's an error in the report, and it, they will be required to provide long-term parking bays, and therefore they will be required to provide and a trip facilities? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the error in not acknowledging the policy provision on the matter will be updated in the report. That's not to say necessarily the staff recommendation would be that they provide the facilities, but the matter will be discussed in the report. OK, I'll make some more comments at next, week, next week's council meeting about um, small, some small businesses having to provide all of that and other businesses providing zero, so thanks. Councillors? Um, just to follow up, Director, on the bike parking, it talks about the fact that the, um, or I think we need to get the revised information on what bike parking is required, but I'd also be interested to know if, if the officer recommendation is still to rely on bike parking within the vicinity, if we could have some information about where the, the closest bike racks are in proximity to the um, site. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, staff have been out there today and on William Street between Forbes and Newcastle there are 12 existing facilities. And just following up on that, any, if we did require them to provide additional in the public realm, I'm always conscious of street clutter and whether there's space, would it be um, deemed to be necessary or appropriate to request that they at least um, pay towards their bike parking requirement in the public realm? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, given the narrow frontage of the tenancy and the potential for that street clutter, uh, if Council was going to require uh, bicycle parking, it would probably be more appropriately done as a cash and loo contribution uh, to enable the city to provide the facility in the local area. Thank you, Director. And just in terms of a couple of the issues that have been raised during public consultation and um, by a member of the Public Gallery this evening. Um, the issue of the takeaway element of the business and the need um, for pick-up set-down. There's two questions I have. I, I note that there's a um, loading zone at the front of the restaurant. I'd welcome administration's advice on whether it would be, um, if this did proceed, whether it would be better for that bay to actually be a pick-up and set-down area and if that would still meet the needs of loading as well as um, takeaway elements and also to request whether it's possible that um, the applicant provide additional information in the parking management plan prior to next Tuesday on how they intend for um, the deliveries and pickups to be um, managed. Um, and also if we could just get some very concise advice on this issue of the historical shortfall versus an approved shortfall. I just would like to know whether administration is treating the um, shortfall of the existing shop as an approved shortfall for the sake of, of policy? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, administration isn't uh, at all suggesting the shortfall has been approved, uh, simply acknowledging there is a land use that exists on site and there is no parking provided. So. It has to be acknowledged that at some point in the past uh, the land use was approved with no parking and if we used a contemporary parking assessment it leads to a nominal credit. Uh, that philosophy was broadly accepted by Council as part of its consideration of the Beaufort Street small bar which was a not too dissimilar, dissimilar situation where there was an existing shop with no parking. Uh, administration uh, put forward and Council broadly accepted the proposition that given the land use was existing or the land use was approved and the land use was operating and existing, there was a nominal credit applicable to the site. Uh, staff have done the same again on this occasion in line with uh, the philosophy adopted for the Beaufort Street example, but that is not to say that it has an approved, uh, an approved shortfall. 
Thank you for the clarification. And just in relation to um, some of the commentary around um, the the change of use, uh, my understanding is that this is a permitted use, and that when the council is not being asked to exercise discretion in in that particular element, that we're just purely exercising discretion or being asked to exercise discretion in relation to parking and bicycle bays. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that's absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Um, I think that everyone who raised a comment or question during the gallery um, has now left, so we'll go back to the beginning of the agenda and work through sequentially. So that means that the next item we're dealing with is 5.1 16 Wellman Street, Perth, amendment to existing approval for light industry meat packing facility. Questions? Councillor Gonczewski. Uh, just on the cover page, um, the recommendation uh, is relating to the deletion of the condition which would imply um, approval in perpetuity um, but the proposal, I don't know if this has been updated, talks about um, approval for a further five years, I think in that section. Can I just get clarification? Uh, through you Mayor Cole, the applicant has sought approval for a further five years. Uh, administration in assessing the proposal and assessing the history of the, of the use has determined that there's probably little risk and little concern with approving it in perpetuity. If Council wishes to take a more cautious approach, uh, it would certainly be able to impose a five-year condition uh, and that would be quite acceptable, particularly given that is what the applicant requested in the first place. Councillors, um, I am interested in um, the five-year um, probably would just request that that be prepared so at least it's on the table. But I did want to ask about the development potential of the sites around the meatpacking use. Um, I note it's in a uh, <clears throat> district centre. And um, just wanted to get a bit of a feel for the adjoining um, sites and what the development potential is. So I'm just kind of thinking through what potential impacts might be if this um, mixed use area is, is developed? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide some uh, potential concepts, or not concepts, but potential outcomes next week. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Councillor Fatakis? Um, through you, Mayor, to the Director. I just also wanted to um, uh, understand if there was discussion around a, um, a term of three years um, and like the Mayor, I'm interested in really getting my head around um, really that period of five years and understanding whether there's a, um, any sort of um, potential impediment in the development within that precinct by um, the approval of uh, such a long period considering we're coming out of a three-year approval. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the applicant uh, applied for a a five-year extension. Um, it is absolutely open to Council to approve uh, any time period it sees fit or refuse the application if it was that way inclined. Um, whilst the, application, the applicant has asked for five years, uh, if Council's of the view that uh, the area may be changing in the, uh, in the near future and would prefer to impose a three-year condition, uh, it is open to do that. It would simply mean that the applicant uh, would be coming back to council sooner, uh, potentially seeking a, a further extension. But there's no there's no statutory impediment in terms of council imposing a three year limitation. Any further questions, Councillor Hallett? Uh, through you to the director of development services. What additional cost would that incur for the applicant? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, it would involve largely an application fee, which for an amendment to an existing approval is quite quite marginal, um, so in terms of documentation required to be prepared, it's very little, so the actual costs implication be negligible. Councillors, okay, thank you. Um, next item is 5.408 Vincent Street, North Perth, change of use from single house to unlisted use millinery. Thank Councillor you, Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. A couple of questions. Uh, on page 83, um, the applicant has indicated that the property has two dedicated car bays. Um, I know there's 
there's the one that's adjacent to the granny flat. Is the other one accessed off the right of way? Is that a car bay? It's not indicated on the plans as a car bay, but is there access? Is that a second car bay? So page 82 shows two triangles. One I know is the carport, but I can't. Oh, sorry, there is a second. Sorry, it's shown on page page 81. It is shown there. So that answers that question. The other question is, uh, if the use was to cease, does the property remain as a residence, or once it's changed, the change of use to millinery, what actually is it? Con is the property able to then be used as a residence? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if the application is approved and the use is changed to millinery uh, and that use ceases, uh, it can revert back to a dwelling because a dwelling is a permitted use in that location and it wouldn't require any physical work, so it could be used thereafter either as the approved use not listed or it can revert back to a dwelling on the basis that it's permitted development that's exempt from the requirement for development approval. Councillors? Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, to the Director, I've got um, a couple of questions. One was about the parking, so that's, um, that's um, been answered. Can I ask whether the applicant is also the owner of the property, Director? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Thank you. Um, in looking at this, um, I'm wanting to know whether you were able to identify any other properties within the Hyde Park precinct that is directly facing Hyde Park on Throssell, Glendower, William or Vincent that have been converted from residential use into businesses? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in assessing this application, administration didn't undertake that investigation, but if it's of interest to councillors, that can be done uh, and reported back to the briefing notes. Thank you, Director. It's certainly of interest to me, um, maybe of interest to other people. Um, so in also in making this assessment, was there well, what, what consideration or weight is given to um, how a change of use and the use of our discretion may contribute to a change in, the, in you know, or a first change as a precedent to the overall area of um, what I think would be regarded as a fairly, fairly historic part of City Vincent. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the application is for a use not listed. It's not exempt development. Um, if this application was approved uh, and that prompted uh, subsequent applications uh, along Vincent Street or Glendow or any other road in the local area, they would, as you'd expect, be assessed on the individual merits, undergo their own consultation period, uh, be assessed in terms of their parking demand and the number of visitations to the site, hours of operation, etc. So in terms of uh, the risk to council that this would present as a problematic precedent, that's not the case. Okay, um, through you Mayor, to the Director. So just in theory then, if we had seven other applications of a similar nature and there was a, you know, a hat, a millinery driven you know, economy bubble, and everyone wanted to convert their houses to millinery or similar businesses of a similar size, et cetera, of a similar kind of low impact. Would that be something then the City of Vincent over time could potentially then approve one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty of those homes being transitioned to businesses? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that is. Potentially, if the, if the applications are received, uh, they are required to be determined and it will be open to Council to determine them favourably if uh, Council is of the view that it had a, an acceptable impact on the local area. Obviously, if there was a large number of applications, uh, Council would need to consider the cumulative impact of, of those proposals. Um, but ultimately, it would be open to Council to approve any application as presented with. I'm through you, Mayor, to the Director. Um, given that this is a discretionary use, if this is refused, what um, recourse does the applicant have? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if the application is refused by Council, it would be open to the applicant to uh, seek a review at the, the Tribunal. Um, but that is whether they apply to the Tribunal is up to the applicant. 
Um, through you, Mayor, I'm just going to foreshadow an alternative recommendation for refusal, um, which I'll liaise um, with the officers tomorrow. Thank you. Councillors. Um, Director, I did have a question. In the consultation, it notes that there were some concerns about the fact that with this changing from a residential to a millinery use, that there would not necessarily have that sort of nighttime activity and it would be empty at night time. I just wanted to ask about the ancillary dwelling. Will that be, um, will that have people living in the ancillary dwelling at the rear? Because I think that really just goes to that issue of whether there are people on site at night time. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the ancillary, if the application to change the use of the single dwelling to a millinery is approved, it effectively renders the ancillary dwelling as the single dwelling on site. Um, this application hasn't, hasn't dealt with that structure at all, but the, uh, the information relayed back from the applicant is that they intend to either occupy themselves or rent it out. So the intention is for it to be occupied as a single dwelling. Uh, but like any other single dwelling uh, anywhere else, there's no way to regulate that it must be lived in. I do, um, yeah, I do understand that. I just thought I'd ask the question what the intention is given it had been raised in the consultations. I thank you for that. Councillor Vitakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, to, through you to the Director of um, Development. Just regarding the trans, um, transferring of the cash and loo from the previous application on uh, 323 Fitzgerald Street to this location, um, is that standard for us to actually take into account previous cash and loo's paid by businesses when they relocate? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I suppose administration aren't suggesting we transfer um, the cash in lieu, but the, the report simply acknowledges that the applicant runs effectively the same business um, at another property in the district, and as part of obtaining approval for that development uh, in Fitzgerald Street, they did pay a cash in lieu contribution. Um, so it's just simply acknowledging that has actually occurred. Councillors? Okay, moving on then to item 5.5, 157 Loftus Street, Leadable, proposed four dwellings. Questions? No questions? Um, Director, I just wanted to um, clarify. It talked about the fact that when it was first advertised, there were some, I think there were two... Um, comments um, in support and two that had concerns and then it was further advertised with no comment. Um, did that mean that the that there was no comment at all received or that the people that saw the plans indicated that they were supportive after originally not being supportive? Uh, through you Mayor Cole, uh, I'll have to clarify that and update the report. Councillor Gonczewski. Sorry, forgive me if I've missed this. Could I just get an understanding of the parking restrictions in the local streets? Um, through you, Michael. Yep, we'll take that on notice and we'll issue some information this week. Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, just with regards to, and be, I think, to the Director of Development Services, um, just with regards to um, the parking for these um, uh, for these uh, residences, um, just referring back to other developments that are on the like um, corner of Galway and um, and Loftus Street, and problems that. Um, have been encountered there with um, parking over the, the crossovers in the path. So is there any way that we can, um, I know that there is um, provision within the approval to ensure that movement of the path users is not impeded during the works, um, but uh, um, after completion and we've got an existing re residence, should it be approved? Um, I'm just um, just really looking back to that as to what more that we can actually do to ensure that residents are aware that they cannot actually park over that crossover. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, in terms of what council can do to make that information available, uh, that could be distributed by um, a 
various means, including the, the Rangers um, or other city staff. It could potentially be open to council to impose a condition requiring uh, the applicant to put a notification on title if council was sufficiently concerned and thought that was a, a reasonable response. Um, but it may well be that it's just simply a it could be a city installing signage in the local area would suffice. Councillors, okay. Um, we move on to item five point six, number five, Scott Street, Leadable Two Group Dwellings. Questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky. I had one just in relation to the um, reason for refusal. The um, uh, sorry, uh, the setback. In the report, it says that there's a setback of three metres. And then somewhere else in the report, it said that they submitted changed plans that increased the setback from to 5.2 metres. Sorry, through you to the Acting Director of Development Services, I may not be able to find exactly where that is at this point in time, but if I could just get clarification that the proposed setback is three metres. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, if you look to page 179, it shows the balcony is being set back three metres. Uh, the reference to another distance may have been the setback to the ground level, perhaps. I have found it. It's on page 170, so that might be useful to just clarify that it's the increased setback of the... I don't know, the main part of the dwelling has been increased from 4.4 to 5.2 metres as a result of the consultation. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in terms of the, the dwelling line, the when we've used the term dwelling line and having it increase from 4.4 to 5.2, uh, that's referring to the substantive building uh, without the balcony. So that's, where that, that's the difference there. Thank you for the clarification. Councillors. Um, Acting Director, I just have a question about the overshadowing. It talks about in the report how a 1.8 metre dividing fence causes the, you know, some degree of shadowing given the orientation of the lot. So I'm just wondering if we could actually get a, given that this is the issue in contention, whether we could get a little bit more information on what degree of overshadowing would be caused by the um, dividing fence and then what the additional overshadowing is caused by the dwelling. And um, in terms of dealing with the overshadowing, has, um, has there been discussion with the applicant about what options they do have to reduce overshadowing, such as having a side courtyard? I'm just wondering at what point did discussion with the applicant cease? Has the applicant requested for this to simply be considered by council and not wishing to make any further um, change to the dwelling? Um, I note that it did go to the DRP, whether they provided any um, advice to the applicant on how to achieve compliant overshadowing. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the, ref the referral to the DRP was largely regarding the front setback uh, as opposed to the, the overshadowing issue. The matter has been raised with the applicant uh, and there's been, some, uh, there's been some discussion on the matter. Uh, the applicant uh, has formed the view that the overshadowing, the extent of the overshadowing is acceptable or should be considered acceptable um, in the ba on the basis that it will only be, uh, as the speaker suggested, uh, several weeks of the year. Um, staff have conveyed uh, its assessment under the design principles, which refers to protecting um, light to north facing windows uh, and given that the R codes refer back to a 21st of June as a, a measuring parameter and on the 21st of June the north facing windows of the front dwelling will be unable to achieve access or uh, unable to achieve solar access. Uh, staff couldn't accept that that would meet the design principles. Uh, the options available to the applicant would largely be to reduce the bulk on the first floor. Uh, because that is, I suppose, the, the cause of the, of the overshadowing. There's limited opportunities. Yeah, we, staff acknowledge that these e the east-west sites are difficult, uh, 
but the obligation is on the applicant to meet the design principles and that would only largely be able to be achieved if the dwellings were either single storey or if they were two storey, the, the bulk on the first floor was reduced. So I'm just wondering, for example, would it mean that the, the, the um, second storey could only be towards the front of the dwelling and it would have to have no single uh, double storey at the rear altogether? Um, and do you think there's any um, merit in seeing whether the applicant would like to go back to the DRP to address this particular issue, given that this is the one reason that um, administration is recommending refusal? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we can certainly contact the applicant and uh, seek their views on the matter. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, just to note that item 5.7 has been withdrawn by the applicant, um, which takes us to item 5.9, Small Business Friendly Local Governments Charter. Any questions on this one? Okay. Um, the next item is a late report which only just arrived very late this afternoon, so I don't expect that council members have had an opportunity to read this, but I'll, just in case there was someone who did manage to do some speed reading, the item is um, number 21, Vincent Street, Mount Lawley, amendment to development approval for alterations and additions to existing consulting rooms and proposed single house. Does anyone have any questions on this at this stage? Okay, I'll take it that that was received too late um, and that you are very welcome to provide um, questions to uh, development services during the week on that one. Um, so we'll move on to engineering. We've dealt with item 6.1, so we go to 6.2, tender number 561 of 18, North Perth Common Construction, appointment of a successful tenderer. Are there any questions on this item? Um, I've got a couple of questions, but we'll probably bring them up during when we move into confidential session because they relate specifically to numbers in the tenders. Yes, thank you. It does have a confidential attachment, so if it's about um, any matters relating to the confidential attachment, we can certainly um, take questions in the confidential session. Are there any questions on the item that is not the confidential part? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item is 6.4, late report, waste strategy project one, recovery of organic material. Oh, so 6.4, sorry. Oh, sorry, 6.3, sorry, I had noted that as raised by the public gallery, but the um, questioners weren't here. My apologies. 6.3, further report in response to petition, Elmer Road and Claverton Streets, North Perth, traffic calming. Jonathan, oh, sorry, Councillor Hallett. Thank you, through you to the Director of um, Engineering. Just a few questions. One was just around the proposed slow points. Um, we we're going to have a look at whether they would have capacity to have side spaces to let cyclists through. Did you, um, were you able to follow that up? Yeah, through you, Michael. Um, we're still finalising the design, but we believe we can. It's all about the width of the road, and we believe we can uh, get the cyclists a straight path through. Um, I just wanted to refer back to the original um, petition wording because it said specifically um, council addresses these issues and engages with the residents to develop acceptable measures to make these streets safe and more livable and the measures developed are included in the next council budget round. Um, just wondered if you could ref comment on, I guess, the considerations about stuff for next year's budget, because it seems like we've only really looked at the, the slow points and then drawn a line under underneath the, the conversation. Yep. Uh, through you, Michael. At this stage, there is nothing planned in relation to this report for next year's budget. Um, if you remember, we did uh, surveys of the area, collected data, used that to um, decide where we believed from a technical perspective where intervention was necessary. That was subject to the previous report from Council. There were a couple of, which were slow points in two streets, uh, and there was a Council decision to install those two, those two uh, slow points. There were some other areas where it was um, uh, borderline in terms of the data, and Council asked us to engage with residents, which again is detailed in this report, which is the meeting at North Perth Town Hall. 
uh, to see what residents thought of that, and, and that's the subject of this report. So currently, uh, the four slow points which are proposed, uh, we can uh, manage from this year's budget, and there's nothing else planned in next year's budget. Councillor Hallett. Would you like me to jump in with a question while you think? Um, I just wanted to ask about the signage associated with the slow points. Um, can we actually get a bit more of a detailed design of what the slow point would look like, how it would work with bike access, where the signage would fall, um, and how many car bays would be removed by putting in a slow point? Um, and could we also get a bit of information about entry statements? I note that they were referred to by UMAG and um, again in the public gallery this evening. Could we get a bit of information about how, where and how entry statements would work and where they, where they could work? Because that does seem to be something that um, residents are interested in pursuing and UMAG did raise that. Um, that would be helpful. And just to query, um, so two were approved at the meeting uh, in October, in September when I was just, I was away, so I can't remember exactly. Not, that's fine. I'm glad that you can all get on and make decisions. That's fantastic. Um, and then two further. So my calculation would be that that would be $14,000 and that the others were already, because I think it talks about under financial $28,000. But I assume that the 14000 has already been set aside as part of the previous decision. That's correct. Through you, Michael, I think the report refers to the total cost of four slow points at seven thousand dollars each. Yes, which is okay. a total of twenty-eight. All right, fair enough. Okay, any further questions on this item, Councillor Hallett? Ah, uh, yeah, two more. Um, just going back to the the previous meeting when we took the petition um, and wanted you to go ahead with the two slow points. Um, the motion that we passed was to engage with the residents within the streets as nominated in the petition and the UMAG on additional traffic calming, safety and amenity measures in the streets nominated, including the locations identified in item 2.3, which were the specific slow points. Um, so I'm just wondering about, in terms of those additional traffic calming, safety and amenity measures, which go to the original petition around more livability that's beyond just traffic calming, what consideration has been given to that? Um, has there been any discussion or is there scope for engagement with Department of Planning um, around place managers and other staff in considering, I guess, a, a less technical approach to um, this particular area? Uh, through you, Michael. So we, um, we let it drop to everyone in the area, and, uh, which is like 150 households, I think, and we made an open invite to that meeting, and you can see that 18 people attended the meeting, I think, from memory. Um, we did put forward the, um, the suggestion for additional slow points to residents, and you, if you were uh, councillors that were at the meeting will remember that we had plans, etc. But we also allowed people to raise any other issue they wanted. We had community safety and the police there. Um, what I will say is no other issues outside of that of traffic were, were um, mentioned. Um, there was some um, discussion about safety of some of the intersections, which, uh, again, we can look into as a separate issue, so we're looking at that separately. Um, and to answer your final point, there's been no discussion with the Department of Planning that I'm aware of about you know, looking at this in a different way. And just in the, in the report, it reflects on the UMAG meeting um, and some advice that the Chair provided within that. Um, uh, just from recollection that the, the chair also mentioned that um, we could look at the budget for the following year. Um, so just wondering if yeah, that could be reflected in the report because it currently um, sounds rather limited in terms of what we actually opened up the discussion around. I'm just not sure that the report really reflects the level of feedback both UMAG and residents have provided in terms of things beyond um, slow points and traffic calming. Yeah, through you, Michael. We can certainly work with the chair to update that wording uh, if he's happy with that. The chair being Councillor Hallett, no less. Any further questions? Councillor Gondoszewski. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the Director of Engineering. Um, just in relation to the previous um, 
uh, discussion that we had at council, um, we, we noted that there were three locations, Alma, Camellia and Alfonso Streets, um, that um, had space sort of close to the intervention that we were considering and, um, and the, the motion um, uh, requested that we engage with residents around um, additional traffic calming safety and amenity measures in the streets nominated in the petition but including the locations identified in item 2.3 which was the um, specific areas of Alma, Camellia and Alfonso. And I just note um, that this item um, just talks about um, additional slow points in Alma and Alfonso but um, doesn't reference a, a slow point in Camellia and just wanting to get some advice as to um, what extent of consultation was conducted with residents in relation to that possible slow point and um, the rationale for not including it um, in this particular recommendation. Yeah, through you, Michael, for recollection. Obviously, everyone in Camellia Street we know, received a letter and it wasn't just the opportunity to come to the open meeting and talk to us, it was also the opportunity to email us anyth anything that a resident wanted to raise. From recollection, there was no support uh, stated for a slow point in Camellia Street or intervention, so uh, that's why we've not recommended it. So, but by no support, we also mean no um, grievance raised against a potential slow point? Correct. So uh, when you look at the 18 people that turned up, there was, um, there was strong support for Alma Road, the additional, uh, there was support for Alfonso, uh, but they were, you're right, nobody turned up and said that they thought Camellia Street uh, required the, that level of intervention. So, um, Just my recollection was not that, was that we didn't have Camellia Street on the plans that were specifically discussed with residents. Was that because we hadn't received anything um, at, at the workshop that, Camille, that there was a draft uh, that was there for Alfonso and Alma, but I don't recall seeing a draft for Camellia. Yes, we may call. I need to check that. I can't remember whether we did have a plan for Camellia or not. And I guess just in relation to the commentary um, that's talked about, um, the um, residents that submitted the detailed responses um, to uh, the request for consultation, um, that, uh, that talked about these, their responses would be on scope of the current proposals. Can I please just get clarification um, that in that, in relation to the wording in this report, that's talking about that the information provided was beyond the scope of what's considered in this recommendation, because my understanding was that there, there hadn't really been a scope set for the previous consultation and engagement with residents about um, traffic calming, safety and amenity in the area. Is that correct? Yeah, so through you, Michael. Um, so what occurred was after the meeting in North Perth Town Hall where 18 people turned up, we did receive two emails um, suggesting uh, completely different approaches to the area. So, for example, uh, there was a suggestion about closing Alma Road at the top end. So... Um, so that's not being considered as part of this report. What we're suggesting is that uh, we install the slow points, we monitor how effective they are. Uh, we do that through UMAG, and we raise the issues um, that were contained in the two emails received after the consultation meeting, if you like, with UMAG, you know, for future reference. Uh, remembering that the data showed that the roads function as they should, the, the numbers of traffic and commercial traffic as well within the limits, uh, you know, in terms of speed, it was borderline. Uh, we don't believe at this stage that um, uh, it's justified, for example, to close the road. The second email was a four-page email which contained uh, a lot of additional information, some of which are small maintenance matters which we can deal with, you know, outside of this process anyway. Um, and I guess also that um, at the um, consultation forum that occurred at um, North Perth Town Hall, um, there were uh, residents there that did raise other issues, and I recall in relation to parking and, and signage, etc. Um, are they able to be summarised and captured here um, within this report? Because I think this um, the, the report seems to be limited to the consultation in relation to mid these two mid-lane slow points and I think um, the intention of the um, consultation at the Town Hall was that it was designed to allow some free-ranging conversation about a variety of issues so it would be good to see that recorded um, somewhere. Um, 
and uh, then, through, oh, sorry, sorry. In, through my call we can do that, we can summarise that before next week. Um, and then this is possibly th um, through to the Acting Director of Development Services in relation to our sustainable urban mobility, I don't know, strategy plan, integrated transport plan, um, that uh, some of these issues in relation to um, raised by um, residents and also potentially UMAG um, in relation to the measures of a safe road environment and some of our um, standards that might be set for intervention in the road environment, um, is that likely to be captured within um, that the, the bounds of what's going to come out of the integrated transport plan? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, broadly yes, uh, but uh, if you prefer, if you like, staff can provide a bit more detail as to what the ITP is going to deliver in terms of uh, an outcome and uh, what staff will do with that information. Yeah. Councillor Hallett. Last one. Um, just as the motion appears at the moment, um, it talks about the data around the slow points will, um, I guess, come to UMAG for some evaluation. Um, but it doesn't talk about continuing any of the other conversation around all of the other issues and ideas that have been raised when the original motion from the previous meeting was to explore things beyond the slow points. Um, so just wondering, or I'll just flag an amendment that um, it would be good to have something in possibly under three um, that includes continuing that conversation with UMAG and residents around a broader precinct approach. And through you, Michael, that's certainly the intention to bring all the other issues and all the other suggestions to UMAG, so if that needs to be reflected in the uh, recommendation, we can do that. Councillors? Okay, um, next item was a uh, late report waste strategy project one, recovery of organic material, food and greens options appraisal. Questions? Um, in relation to this item, I did have a question around um, some further information that I would really like to seek um, around whether we should actually be providing in principle support for the development of a business case. Um, and I just think that um, in terms of the information that comes back uh, to council would really like to see um, more detailed financial modelling uh, in a business case uh, with a consultation plan and as well as um, how that will then uh, influence public um, engagement and communication strategy. So um, no issue with the support in principle but I think that there is a step missing around provision of a business case. I'm just wondering if I could get some advice from administration on that? Yep, through you, McCall. Um, it's certainly possible. Uh, we, the current recommendation talks about coming back in February or March, I mean, uh, with implementation plan. We can certainly um, do that in the form of a business case and amend the recommendation accordingly if that's what Council wish. Um, well, just my understanding is it's a requirement to present a business case to Council on any um, new initiative of more than $250,000 in value. So given that this is a potentially $1.2 million um, investment, um, I would definitely prefer um, whether administration consider, considers it or whether I flag an amendment or an alternative, I think that the business case element um, is important. Through my call, certainly that's no problem. Councillors, any other questions on this item? Okay. Um, next item is uh, we're moving on to corporate services now. So 7.1 late report. I don't think we've received the investment report at this stage, not when it come in at the last minute. 7.2 authorisation of expenditure for the period 17th of October to 13th of November. Any questions on this item? No. Um, 7.3, financial statements as at 31st of October 2018. 7.4, late report, financial statements as at 30th of November 2018. Still waiting. That will be coming to the next meeting, um, given that end of month was only four yeah. days ago. We're still working on those meetings. Yeah, so what sort of 
would we be able to expect them on Friday, do you think, with the issuing of the agenda? We will aim for Friday. Um, it, it might be tight, but we will aim for Friday. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, 7.5 land exchange, portion of lot 75 Brentham Street, Brentham Street Reserve, for portion of lot 100, number 20, Brentham Street, Aaron Moore Catholic Primary School. Questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, just in relation to the, um, oh, sorry, now I'm going to have to get there. The um, uh, lot um, 37 what the current use of that facility is and if there's been any discussion around um, ongoing continued access to that um, building and then also whether um, what uh, sort of um, state of repair the building is in um, in terms of ongoing asset costs. Through you, Mayor Cole, that building is currently used by the Aramore Catholic College. Um, I think it's their music school, and the proposal would be that it would be demolished before the land exchange took place, so we'd receive it as a vacant lot. Councillors? Oh, I won't ask. Um, can I ask a couple of... Oh, sorry, you go, Councillor Patakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's just a, a question with regards to um, on uh, the retention of trees in the land that um, will be part of coming from the, the city and, and swap. Was there any consideration given to um, how we would be able to actually um, protect or preserve those um, the mature trees that are on, on the lot um, proposed to actually be going from the city? Through you, Mayor Cole. The proposal is that the land will be used in the same manner, so it wouldn't appear. Um, we wouldn't anticipate that any trees would be removed at this stage. And if they did propose to extend the school or anything like that, they would need to apply for development approval. So, it would be considered then. Um, but does that? I mean, I, I know what I'm concerned, and we've seen that in a number of schools throughout um, Western Australia, where there's been where the um, local government has had very little um, power um, uh, over, you know, in that control. So, is there any additional um, protection mechanism that you think that we should be considering? Through you, Mayor Cole, we can take that question on notice and consider further. Just for clarity, following on from that question. Obviously, a DA would be required to develop the school, but no DA would be required to remove the trees if they own the land. Is that correct? Through you, Mick Hole, that's correct. If the if the application came in as one bundle that involved the removal of the trees, that would be uh, a consideration. But if the applicant sought to remove the trees in isolation, that wouldn't require its own development approval. Perhaps it would actually help if we get um, a better um, plan. I think that would be very interesting to, I mean, there's a large car park and then there's the playground area. So one of the questions that I have is, is it possible to actually then, apart from the boundaries of the proposed land swap area, to actually get an um, overlay of where the existing site of the playground is um, and also the um, oval and whether there's going to be ongoing lease arrangements between the City of Vincent and Aranmore um, Primary School? Um, another question I have is that given that the land swap would involve lot 37, which is currently containing the music um, house, I do think that that might be something that the school community may not actually be aware of this land situation and we um, would be very helpful to know what sort of communication strategy the school will have in place with their school community. I think that's quite an important part of this process. Thank you, Mayor Cole. We can address that through the briefing notes. Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, to the um, Director. Can I just double check on here, and I've probably missed it, um, in regards to the car parks, what's happening with those? Do you mean will they remain as car parks? Or? Well, the one that the city owns, are we keeping it, or do they... 
has the prayer circle included that car park as well that they can that they can um, get gifted? What, what's happening? Because there's been ongoing issues with access, no access, who owns what? Through you, Mayor Cole, so part of the proposed land exchange area does include the area that's used by them as a staff car park at the moment. So that w it would be proposed that that would become part of their land and then they could use it for car parking. The okay. Um, another question through you, Mayor. So what happens with the other car parks? There's two car parks there. One is owned by the city and I'm advised that one's owned by um, the school. So what's happening with both of them? Through you, Mayor Cole, so the car park that is within Lot 100, that would remain, so that's owned by the school, so that remains as the school car park. The car park that's within Lot 75 in the area that's proposed to be exchanged with the um, Macaulay Property Group would become part of the school's land then, so that it could be used by the school. Um, may I request that that be a bit more clearly articulated on the maps? Because at the moment, both of those car parks are used completely by the school. It's a sweetheart deal, you know, add that one to the list. Um, one's a kind of a, there's a bit of it, there's a kiss and ride that's been put in. There's an exclusive staff car park, but there's another car park that is used by, by the school. And we just need to um, be aware in all of this land exchange that we don't end up having um, a car park being used, which is in front of the lot that we're going to, uh, I'm assuming, turn into green open space. I, I have, may I ask, have the officers been down to the site to have a look? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we have had several site visits with the school and Macaulay Property Great. Group. Great. Okay. So may I ask that this map be more clearly articulated and that it be spelt out exactly what's happening with the car parks and who can do what on them? Thank Through you. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can provide an updated plan with more detail. Councillors, um, I just did want to ask, just out of curiosity, on lot um, 37, which is part of the um, the proposed land swap, um, what right of way widening um, would be required um, if that lot was to be developed in the future? In terms of seeding of land, I'm just interested to know what the Three city year. might have to seed. Three year, Mayor we'll have to take that question on notice. Thank you. And just in relation to the recommendation, just a query about whether, um, I'm sure this would all be spelt out through the process, but it talks about um, clause three authorises the CEO to provide public notice of the city's intention to dispose of a portion, etc. cetera. Um, I'm just querying whether we should include in that statement in exchange for, so that it's clear that we're not simply disposing of land, but we're doing potentially, um, the proposal is to do a direct land swap of absolute equal proportion. Through you, Meko, yes, we can amend it like that. Thank you. Um, if administration agrees, otherwise I'm happy to um, flag an amendment. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, my a question, I guess, um, learning a little bit from history, um, and perhaps this is a question um, through Mayor to the CEO about whether, because I mean, I guess I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do with all of this land, um, and I won't be around for those future decisions, but I would be very concerned if the school comes back and asks to lease a portion of the land that we're about to swap out so they can build some more playgrounds and stuff for their school, because this is how this all started. So I'm wondering whether there's any way the administration can um, put some conditions on this land um, in regards to keeping it either truly um, either public space or at some future point if we're going to sell it off that's a different story but if it's to be public open space that it actually be fully public open space and remain that way. I'd be concerned if we, if we I'll talk to it more next week but I think people understand my concerns. Some of you, Matt. Through you, Mayor Cole, can I just uh, clarify with Councillor Harley, is that for the land that is to go to the city in the reserve area, which is currently used as the um, as an overflow school playground? 
Um, I hadn't actually considered that, but yes, that probably needs to be included. It's the land um, on Brentham, Brentham Street. Councillor Holly, Lot 32. So just in relation to that question I asked about overlaying any proposed leasing arrangements and also perhaps if we include in that any fencing, like for example, is the um, area in yellow um, where it cuts across um, that sort of back parkland area, is that going to be fenced or will the school leave that open and continue to use that um, open space as part of their playground? So that overlaying may help answer that question about potential leasing and um, what use will continue, whether it's leasing or whether it's sort of more informal. I think there's two elements there. So just for clarity, were you asking whether the school was going to be fencing that land or whether the city is going to be fencing that land? Um, I'm just asking whether it's going to, whether there's going to be any fencing I'm not proposing fencing. I'm just asking what what is what the administration's and schools' plan is around fencing. Perhaps perhaps we should just look at whether access rights are formally uh, acknowledged or otherwise in terms of fencing, gating, or otherwise, because it currently, to there's no question, it currently visually appears as part of the school land uh, and the way in which it's used and whether or not. Uh, the intent is for that to continue and if it is whether we as the city should be formalising that in some way uh, or whether it should be fenced at our expense, their expense, jointly gated or otherwise to acknowledge that there is a, an, at the conclusion of this process if it is approved that there is a, a land boundary that exists there. Uh, th through you Mayor Cole, uh, only to make the comment that my understanding that there are security concerns from the school about uh, public access uh, through uh, through that area, which is currently used as a currently used as a school playground. Uh, just for clarity, but the area that is so not uh, the, there is an area that is fenced that they lease for a dollar a year from us currently, uh, which is adjacent to it. Are you? saying that there is, as my understanding is, there's free access in between those two zones, one of which they lease from us, the other of which they don't. But my understanding is that any fencing or otherwise is, is the school, the land that immediately abuts it is actually currently leased by the school. And my understanding was that that playground was in fact fenced, the, the one that is covered. Um, so the, I may be able to... Can I answer? Is that okay? So the area that they had the peppercorn lease on um, was completely fenced, and then there's um, a fence on Brentham Street, which remains a mystery as to how it got there and who paid for it, but it's there, um, and that is fenced across the front of the park um, facing out onto Brentham Street. Um, then the other portion which is accessed, which they're concerned about, is a slim um, area of land between Rosewood and the land, which is currently ours, which they have fenced off for playgrounds. So there's a couple of ingress points there at the moment. So it sounds like we're seeking um, a, s a series of information. We're seeking to understand um, where the current playground and oval use overlaps the um, lands potential land swap areas, what the ongoing use will be both on whether there's a proposal to have a leasing arrangement, an informal arrangement, or just um, use by virtue of the fact that it is directly next door to the land, where there is existing fencing in the area that is City of Vincent land, and whether there's any proposal for future fencing um, if the land swap is, um, does proceed. Does that sort of capture the key issues? Yeah, and just for my clarity, lot 38 and 39 are owned by the school, is that correct? Yes. And the rear of lot 38 and lot 39 are fenced on the boundary currently? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's correct. They are fenced. Do they have gate access into the...? I don't believe they do have gate access, but we can check that. OK, and just if we can get clarity as to whether they would have rights to act, although I assume they would have rights to access. Um, well, actually, what's the zoning of the... The land that currently has the playground on it? Um, public open space. 
can't be R60 and public open space. Um, it's lot not 37 is R60, but the lot to the rear that's got the large tree on it in the overhead map, that's currently zoned as public open space, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Through, through you, Chair, there's a gate from lot 39 um, out into that car park area. Um, they may wish to apply to put a cafe in there, perhaps, based on some of our, pre our previous decision. Is that a question, Councillor? No, no, Holly? just a, just an observation. Oh, okay. All right. Any further questions on this yep. item? I do. So, you now I'll, I'll use the uh, the magic of technology. So, if I'm correct, and I'll ask this perhaps to the CEO or perhaps of Maluka, if you can see. Apologies to those who are facing that way. You might want to live stream this because you might catch it on that camera. So, so highlighting page. Um, I've zoomed what in page now. is this of the report? Page, page 389. So lot 37 is currently zoned R60, is that correct? As is 38 and 39, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, what would be the zoning of this land that would go to the school? Would that be zoned at the time? Because I assume it's currently not public open space in its entirety. So what would be the zoning of that land when it is uh, after the land swap? because I assume it would pose problems for them and their future plans if it was given, they, they would then need to go through some form of amendment. And this land here is currently zoned public open space, is that correct? That's correct. And we would pro be proposing that the land that's exchanged, so provided to the school, would be zoned public purpose primary school. So it would need to go through so a scheme that would need amendment. To go through a, so that, that portion there would need to go through a scheme amendment? Yes, that's correct. That remains as is, and there's no scheme amendment proposed for here, even though it would be vacant land at that time. It wouldn't be proposed, that would remain as, R, as R60. That's our proposal, yes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Um, yeah, so just again for clarity, a, a minor question, and I'll go down there myself tomorrow and have a bit of a look, but the area marked in yellow do you, where's the locate? there's two playgrounds down there. Um, is that, are we ensuring that, like there's separation between those two playgrounds or are we proposing to move one of them? So there's two big pieces of play equipment down there. You can't see it on the photo, but there is. So, is, does that email. line that goes through, does that separate out the two pieces of play equipment? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we'll clarify that on a more detailed plan to show the boundary between the two okay. playgrounds. And just for clarity, and I think um, it's important in terms of um, the, you know, the public, um, public discussion on this. So the land that's going to the school, so that's 2,300 square metres, which um, consists of the two current leased land that is currently public open space and also that thinner part between the Rosewood and the school. When you say it's going to be, that it goes through a scheme amendment, will that land be able to be developed on, subdivided, sold off for other development? Are we putting, is there, are there any kind of caveats on it that it remain public open space or will it just be once they own it, they'll be able to do as they wish in accordance with the rules? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I believe the intention is to rezone it or redesignate the site. Uh, it's not zoned; it's reserved. But redesignate the reserve from public open space to public purpose primary school. Uh, if, uh, redesignate it from public open space to public purpose primary school. Um, if that amendment was ultimately successful and gazetted, uh, the school's land holding would be a consistent reservation, being public purpose primary school. Uh, and it would be open to them to seek to develop it in accordance with that reservation. Um, can I just ask a follow-up question? It is interesting to note that this parcel of land as part of the land swap does actually contain the sewer line and the drainage line. Would that constrain um, development on that site for the school if they did want to go down the path of built form? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, if there was subterranean infrastructure, uh, the short answer would be yes, that would be a constraint, but not one that's necessarily insurmountable. Uh, but if they wanted to pursue a built form outcome which was constrained by that, they would need to consult with the service providers and potentially reconfigure uh, the infrastructure. Thank you, Director. Any further questions? 
Okay, thank you. Next item is uh, late report, November 2018, budget review. Three. Mayor, three. Thank you. Um, to you, Director. I've got uh, just a question um, um, I noted. Sorry, is this... Um, because it pertains to legal advice, is this... Sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Ignore me. Sorry. No, this is... This is um, the, the November budget review, so some adjustments. Any questions on, on that? No? Okay. Um, next item is 7.7, .7, lease of 15 Haines Street, North Perth to North Perth Playgroup, Inc. Questions? Um, I did have one question, Director. It talks about aligning the lease with the existing um, lease with the Shalom um, Dental surgery. I just wondered what's the um, existing, when does the existing lease end for Kids Galore on that site? I thought it might potentially be six months or 12 months earlier. I'm happy for you to take it on notice if you don't have that information to hand. Thank you, Mel. We'll take that on notice. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Okay. So we're moving on now to community engagement. Uh, 8.1, late report, banks reserve, master plan, consideration of submissions and adoption. Any questions? Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you. A um, couple of specific questions through you to the Director of uh, Community Engagement. Um, the width, the proposed width of the path, uh, there seems to have been some community feedback uh, that the width of the path uh, provides for uh, not only effectively two-way traffic but would encourage cycling on the path as well. I understand that it's got intended to be compacted limestone which will discourage cycling certainly at high speeds but uh, is there any appetite or desire to perhaps uh, reduce the width of the, of the path? I understand that it's four metres, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, no, the, the oval path, um, that there is two different paths um, in addition to the boardwalk proposed within the master plan. So the widening of the path to four metres is the um, fundamentally the shared use path that follows the river. Uh, the oval path, which was subject to um, some commentary through the public comment period, um, is not envisaged to be anywhere near that width. It is um, quite simply a pedestrian path, um, more than likely 1.2 to 1.6 metres in width, and that will be compacted limestone. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the removal of the cricket nets, there was some commentary about uh, the loss of amenity and the, the fact that it's quite widely used. Is that something that we've got any data on? And, and also the availability of cricket nets within, within the immediate locality in our whether it be within our local government boundary or not? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the, the advice, um, or more so the, the information that informed the master plan, is uh, primarily based on on-site observations, which demonstrated quite high utilisation of the soccer goal, but um, quite low utilisation of the cricket nets. Uh, the closest cricket nets, I will just take that on notice and confirm that within the briefing notes, um, but certainly uh, administration were trying to seek a balance between active uses with the proposal for an upgraded playground, an oval path, an upgraded mini court. Um, they were seen as higher priorities um, rather than retaining both the soccer goals and the cricket net. Um, it was identified to retain just the soccer goals. Um, so that was the rationale behind um, removing the cricket nets. Um, and there was some commentary around the fire pit and I guess the uh, some of the safety aspects or otherwise. I guess, is there, do we have any information or data on the viability of, uh, given that the, the intent would be for the area to be locked when it's not in use, obviously it would be on certain occasions that it would be appropriate to use. Uh, is there any analysis other than it's just something cool and different to, to have in a, in a public space about its actual uh, public benefit, I suppose, given that the, the management of it needs to be quite strict? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the, um, the desire to put a, a fire 
pit in the reserve was primarily driven by consultation with uh, our Aboriginal stakeholders and in particular an Aboriginal elder who identified the location um, of the reserve, the amphitheatre setting as being quite suitable for a range of different cultural events. So that was really the key driver behind the fire pit being included in the master plan. Administration has done quite a lot of investigation in terms of how that fire pit, pit may be designed and how it can be effectively managed in a public place. So administration is certainly comfortable that it can be effectively managed and used. Um, and as I say, the, the rationale has been based on um, stakeholder consultation. And the last question just relates to the compacted limestone and its suitability for uh, universal access. So whether wheelchairs, which are quite heavy, but more so people who are, uh, whether it's bumpy for people pushing prams or for people with uh, walkers or otherwise, whether the compacted limestone, I know often it's a cost benefit, but I do note some of the issues uh, with, uh, for example, Elizabeth Key, where they've opted for uh, uh, cobblestone paving, which is extremely inhospitable to people on wheels in one form or another. But just if we can get some commentary, if there is any data around compacted limestone and its suitability. Through you, Mayor Kyle, I can certainly provide some more technical advice within the briefing notes, but engineering have, um, when preparing the master plan and looking at the, the compacted limestone path, confirmed that it can be installed um, at a satisfactory level from an accessibility perspective. Um, being mindful, but that it does require additional maintenance to make sure that um, trip hazards and dips and those sort of things don't... Um, impact that accessibility. So yes, it can meet the standards, however it does require an increased level of maintenance to maintain that level of accessibility. Councillor Council Harley. Um, a conversation, sorry, a question through you, Mayor, um, to the Director. I do share some um, concerns in regards to the fire pit, so I'm wanting to get some more information from that um, Director. Um, which do you have um, the name of which elder recommended that a fire pit would be, you know, part of or could be part of that space and its kind of cultural appropriateness? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I can confirm it was Uncle Noel Manup. No worries. And do does administration have a management plan in place for the use of that fire pit? Um, any ongoing issues with public usage of it, of it during um, fire season, but also how that's going to be controlled, who can use it, under what circumstances? Because that, that's the only concern I've got about this master plan um, at the moment. And I, I, um, I will ask some more questions on the record next week, but I guess I'm asking you for more information about a fire pit being, um, being included in a space that does not have... CCTV TV does not have security, um, et cetera, et cetera. I threw you, Mayor Cole. At this point in time, there is not a management plan, given the fact that we're, we're still at the master plan level. Um, however, administration, as I mentioned previously, have um, already undertaken some work around um, how this fire pit would need to be designed and managed. So I certainly agree with your sentiment that if, if this was to be included in the master plan, um, management of that fire pit would be a very important consideration. Administration are already aware of that. And if it is included in the master plan, then that would be um, something that administration would need to prepare. Councillors, any further questions on Banks Reserve? Okay, next item is 8.2, Late Report, Public Open Space Strategy, Consideration of Submissions and Adoption. Any questions on this item? Just to note, there were some questions um, from the public gallery this evening, and I think one of the questions was whether letters were sent to sports clubs on the city's lease premises about the consultation period. Um, and reference to tennis clubs um, being accessed by membership only. Um, if we could perhaps just deal with those in the briefing notes or if you have answers. Through Mayor Cole, I'll certainly reaffirm consultation with the sporting clubs in the briefing notes, but um, I can categorically confirm that the sporting clubs were consulted during preparation of the public open space strategy. Um, in relation to the commentary around tennis club membership, um, 
it is actually on page eight of the strategy. I do agree with Mr Meyer in the sense that um, that wording could possibly be amended slightly, but the intent behind that wording is that access to tennis clubs is restricted. Um, whilst you can indeed um, access courts to play tennis, you can only do so if you're a member or you can only do so if you pay a charge to use those courts. So access is restricted. They are leased sites and therefore you need approval from the club to access those sites. That is the sentiment behind that paragraph. I think solely using the word membership um, is not quite accurate. Um, so I will review that during the week and, if necessary, make an amendment prior to the council meeting. Thank you, Director. Um, any further questions on open space? Okay. Moving on to Chief Executive Officer items. 9.1, Council recess period 2018 to 19, delegated authority to the CEO. Any questions on this item, Councillor Toppelberg? Just confirming that the call-in rights are individual, not multiple members. Previously there had been uh, multiple members. But I know in, in recent years it's only been a single member, but just confirming that if someone wants it to come to Council they can request that and that then means that by virtue of this decision uh, it will be determined by Council at the next meeting, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's correct. So if Council was of a view to want to require three or more elected members or something similar to require something to be called in, is that something that, that can be done by amendment? Is that was the desire of Council to provide, to change that delegation? Is that possible? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, it could be changed like that. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, 9.2 Leadable Gardens Incorporated, adoption of new rules of the association. Questions? Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, sorry. Just uh, understand the draft rules of the constitution preserve a role for the city in the management of the association and the operating surplus trust and um, uh, just be grateful for some advice on the, whether there was discussion around the purpose and benefit of this, either to Leadville Gardens Association or city residents and ratepayers. Sorry, Councillor Gondoshevsky, would you mind repeating the question? If the city is to preserve a role in relation to the management of the association and um, and the um, and operating surplus trust. Um, I just, what, if there could be a discussion, I'm happy to take it on notice of around um, what the purpose and benefit of this is to the city. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the report essentially maintains uh, the role of the city. Uh, with Leaderful Gardens, uh, what administration would propose is that um, we organise a separate report or a workshop with council members on uh, the future association, uh, including the role of um, the, the trust. Um, given this is possibly a logical time to actually undertake that discussion, is there a time imperative for the consideration of this matter? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I understand there is uh, an imperative uh, for them to update uh, their constitution. I can't quite find the reference in the report, um, but we can bring that to um, Council's attention between uh, now and the meeting next week. And just as f I think it says it in the report, but I can't recall. If we were to go through this process now and then to wish to change the constitution at some point in future, does the city have the power to require that to occur or is there um, a need uh, to you know, 
uh, have support of other, other members, etc., to have a special meeting to consider any changes the city may wish to request to the constitution? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, my understanding is that we could in initiate that conversation uh, with the board at any time. And just one more, just in relation to the, um, just a question around um, what the process is for the disbursement of the funds collected under the trust, how much is currently in there, if there's plans for, for that disbursement to occur. Um, I believe this is something that's sort of been discussed in the periphery previously, but I'd be grateful for an update. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide that update in the notes for the meeting next week. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, CEO, I think that, that would be part of the discussion about the ongoing um, relationship because we have states in the report that trans the, the um, trust funds have been transferred to the city for disbursement in accordance with the trust, but I believe that we're still awaiting advice on um, public benevolent institutions in the city of Vincent and there was different parameters around at certain points in the constitution there were tighter parameters and the report talks about the fact that we're moving back to public benevolent institutions. I think um, an update on how that body of work is going would be much appreciated. Uh, through you Mayor Cole, yes we can um, provide clarification on that for uh, the Ordinary Council meeting next week. Thank you. Any further questions on the Leadable Gardens matter? Okay. Next item is uh, audit committee minutes and uh, annual financial report 1718. Any questions? Okay. Um, late report, annual report 2017-18. Questions? Councillor Hallett. Um, just a couple in terms of the gender equality report. It referred to improvements in the gender pay gap within the technical and admin officers levels. Just wondering if you can elaborate on what those improvements were to the CEO through the Mayor. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide that information uh, ahead of the meeting next week. Um, and also under the, the list of kind of initiatives that the city's engaged in, it mentions leadership and development opportunities for women. Are you able to elaborate on that perhaps in the briefing notes? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can. Um, and I get maybe it relates a little bit to um, a comment from the public gallery around, I guess, level of detail and trends and that kind of thing. Um, just wondering if it's, maybe it's too late, but whether there's opportunity to expand on some of that content throughout, but also in that section, given that, that most of that report was copied from last year's with a couple of numbers changed. Um, it would be useful to have a little bit more of a, I guess, a reflection on what's different um, from previous years in there. Um, and then also there was a comment about attendance at workshops being included, which um, I don't think was, and if it's possible to get my name spelled um, correctly in a few of the tables. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes to the um, question about whether or not we can provide a year-to-year -year, uh, breakdown on the gender uh, equity report in um, particular. I'll take on notice that uh, the question from the gallery about attendance at council workshops and yes, we will ensure all councillor, councillors' names are spelled correctly in the final report before it's published. Um, just on that issue of the uh, recording of attendance at briefings, my understanding was at the time they weren't being recorded by our former governance officer and that there was then um, a basically couldn't put it in the annual report but they have since been recorded and I think we just need to look into what commitment was given to include that. I certainly don't have an issue with that but at the time that information wasn't being recorded. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. I think at the, uh, at the time that the Code of Conduct was uh, amended last, was the, was the, there was further discussion about it, uh, and the Code of Conduct included uh, discussion about, attendan about attendance or the, or the expectation under performance of duties, and I think that the CEO at the time uh, undertook a commitment to record attendance and to provide that information um, in the annual report from memory. 
thank you. Um, I just had a few, there's a few sort of typos and changes and clarifications of information. I'm just wondering um, who I should provide that to during the week. Uh, thanks, Mayor Cole. Please provide them directly to myself. Sure. <laughs> um, councillors, any further questions on that in your report? Okay. Um, 9.5, Information Bulletin. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to draw attention to item number 10. It's on page 679, and it's in regards to the parking infringement write-offs under delegate authority from July 2017 to June uh, 2018. Um, I would be interested in seeing, um, certainly since my time on council since 2011, uh, I know these write-offs have been up to half a million dollars a year, so I would imagine that 184,000, you know, is actually it's a lot of money, but it's it's actually pretty good in comparison. Um, I would be interested, just for my interest, others may be interested, is to see a um, bit of a comparison, um, you know, whether it's four years, five years, etc., um, just to see whether there's truly been a downward trend or whether it's just my memory playing tricks. I'm still interested. Um, in and again, this has gone down from about fifty-five thousand dollars from memory. Um, the area of um, range administrative adjustment, and I know, um, be interested in again having a little bit more of a breakdown of that. At one point, we were provided every every few months a breakdown of what was actually happening. So, um, at what point that they were being written off? Um, just just out of interest, not on a regular basis. I'd be interested in seeing that report. Um, and also interested in um, the breakdown on the um, vehicle mismatch, so item number five, about how is that occurring, the, the mismatching, whether that's at point of um, ticketing um, or whether that's you know wrong number plates on cars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can certainly provide that comparison table. Um, it's quite easy to compile, so we'll include that in the briefing notes. In terms of uh, the range of administrative adjustments, um, I do keep quite a, an eye on that myself. Uh, quite often it is um, user error by ranges, unfortunately. That, um, I would hope, will continue to improve over the coming months and years because this year we did upgrade the devices um, for the ranges, which are now more a, a mobile phone type device as opposed to a almost a laptop sized um, device. So that will certainly assist. Um, we do still have a number of casual ranges and particularly um, casual rangers who work um, during events at NIB Stadium. So that unfortunately is quite often where some errors um, do occur. Um, Reassuringly, but over the last six months, there has been an increased um, level of diligence whereby a ranger identifies the error immediately, and then um, unfortunately that can't be withdrawn and changed, but they then do reissue another infringement immediately afterwards. And quite often that's because the ranger is identified they've used the wrong penalty, um, and if that is the case, then ultimately when it comes to um, appeal or a court, um, prosecution, and um, we will we'll lose that. So, um, certainly happy to keep an eye on that and provide that information to council. The vehicle mismatch, I will provide some more information in the briefing notes. There has been quite an increase in that um, in this bulletin compared to the previous one. I understand that is primarily due to some changes in terms of how the Department of Transport um, deal with the um, vehicle registrations, but I'll get the exact information in the briefing notes for council members. Councillor Fatakis. Um, just uh, through you, Mayor, to, um, to the Director, just regarding the um, point number nine, the um, resident or visitor permit um, permits issued but not displayed. I mean, there's um, 400 instances there. It's quite um, excessive. I mean, how, how do we actually know that um, it just isn't a matter of uh, visitors um, outnumbering the number of permits that are actually held by um, by the resident? Um, yeah, it just it seems like an excessive amount, that 400. Through you, Mayor Cole, the reason why that number is high and, and generally continues to be high is the first offence provision that's in the um, council policy. So that does enable 
um, any resident if they do receive an infringement for failure to display a permit um, on their first offence that is withdrawn. So that is the reason why that is the um, one of the higher numbers in terms with withdrawals. Um, Again, in terms of improvement, uh, the new parking permits do have a QR code on them and with the new devices what that um, has enabled us to do is start to weed out some of the, the duplicate permits. Now the rangers have the ability to cancel a permit and when they scan that with their device it confirms that that's no longer a valid permit as opposed to relying upon purely a visual inspection. So that hopefully is decreasing um, more of, I guess, the, the fraudulent type approach to this, but primarily um, that number is due to the first offence provision. Not a question, but um, can I say well done on getting that down? Thank you. Yes, Councillors? Um, just a couple of questions in relation to the SAT matters. Um, so through you to the Director of Development Services. Uh, and if these are subject to confidentiality or legal privilege, just say so and you can not answer them until later, I guess. Uh, so 17 Harwood Place, has uh, that matter been resolved yet? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that matter was resolved yesterday morning. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and has the DA for Richmond Street, uh, for 122 and 120 Richmond Street, has that been received? That's the one um, with the unauthorised structures? No. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I'll take that on notice and report back. Okay. Uh, and the directions hearings for both Moyer Street and Gina Street were scheduled for the 23rd of November. Um, actually, I'll, let's, I can ask you that separately. The one, the uh, Lord Street is coming back after mediation, for, so there's a direction from SAT for reconsideration. Uh, are we able to get an indication of whether there's been any changes to to the plans, or is that something that needs to be re-advertised, or is the result of mediation had any uh, material change to the DA at all? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the applicant has offered material changes uh, to the application. It's not yet been advertised, um, but I can provide council a separate update on those changes. So I guess so. The, the reason for the honour before the 22nd of February was to allow for it to be, be advertised and assuming it wouldn't be ready in time for the January meeting. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, I believe that's correct, but I can clarify that. Councillors. Okay. Um, that concludes the reports for this evening other than the confidential items. So for those who have tuned in on the live stream, we say thank you and good night. And then we will go um, to uh, behind closed doors session.